Check, check. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about messaging and RabbitMQ and troubleshooting today. My name is Michael, and co-presenting with me is Dmitry. I work for Pivotal on the RabbitMQ team. Dmitry is with Mirantis. Um, yeah, and the, the first part is Dmitry's, so I will. So let's start. Um, first, uh, so we have that plan. First, I will tell you what is auto messaging, how it is used by OpenStack. Then I'll give you uh, like some tips how to, you can troubleshoot it uh, and give some pieces of advice how you can avoid actually troubleshooting it in advance. Uh, then there will be uh, Michael's uh, part where he will uh, deep into details how you can troubleshoot uh, RabbitMQ and how you can uh, set, up, set it up so again, you don't need to troubleshoot it. Uh, let's start. So uh, what is also messaging? Uh, Oslo Messaging, it's a library which enables uh, services which uses it to build RPC clients and servers. Uh, that's its first task. And second task, uh, it enables uh, services to emit and handle notifications. Uh, it doesn't do it directly. I mean, it doesn't do RPC directly. It doesn't send notifications directly. Instead, it uses various backends. Uh, you can see the list of backends on the screen. Uh, so Oslo Messaging supports all, all of them via drivers. Uh, the notable thing is that RabbitMQ is supported by two different drivers. Uh, one of them is based on Combo Library, and another is on Pico Library. Uh, but here on this presentation, we will speak solely about Combo Driver. Uh, if you use uh, RabbitMQ with Oslo Messaging, uh, most probably you are using it, because Pico was added only in Mitaka. Uh, it is worth adding that uh, Oslo Messaging is a project which is developed purely in OpenStack. So it's, it's our project. Uh, sorry, it's our project. And uh, mostly OpenStack services use it for internal communication. So Nova uses it to, uh, to communicate between itself, uh, Neutron uses it, and, and so forth. Uh, I'll add more examples later. Uh, so here is the first example. Uh, this is a rough overview how spawning a VM looks uh, from the point of view of Nova. First client sends HTTP requests, and then Nova starts working. It sends RPC requests between itself, so Nova API sends to Nova Conductor. Conductor's query scheduler to figure out which host uh, can be used to spawn VM, and then it sends a request to, to appropriate compute node to spawn a VM. Uh, as you see, all interaction here goes through RPC, Oslo Messaging RPC. So it is a really essential part of your cloud. If, it, if uh, messaging doesn't work, then the only thing you will have working is Keystone. Uh, here are more examples of uh, internal messaging between various components, or sorry, within various components. But it is also wor worth noticing that there is a at least one example when services communicate with each other with uh, messaging. <coughs> Sorry, uh, it is that um, uh, each OpenStack component sends notifications uh, to Silometer. Uh, we've seen picture how uh, uh, OpenStack components use messaging, but where where is RabbitMQ in this picture? Uh, let's review one piece of that communication between Nova Conductor and Nova Compute. Um, so when Nova Conductor wants to send an RPC request to Compute, it actually puts a message into a queue in a RabbitMQ, and uh, Nova Compute reads this message from there. Uh, if Nova Compute wants to send a reply back, it puts a message into another queue, and Nova Conductor reads it. So that's it. Uh, next step, uh, we're getting uh, closer to troubleshooting, actually. Uh, how can you understand that you have problems with messaging? Uh, most, probably, most probably, you'll understand that you have problems when something doesn't work, you look into logs, and uh, when in logs you see that, uh, that magic word, Oslo messaging, uh, <laughs> it means that you actually have hit it. So here on the second line, you see the Oslo messaging highlighted. Uh, and 
let's now let's switch to actually troubleshooting. So uh, the caption is my favorite exception, uh, and you see the exception name. It's messaging timeout. Why it's my favorite? Uh, because uh, people claim that it happens due to different reasons, but uh, the truth is you can't just seeing that it's messaging exception. You just can't tell what actually happened. Uh, let me dive into details why. Uh, uh, to do that, I need to dive a little deeper into how Oslo Messaging works. Actually, it supports several different operations. Uh, the first one operation is a cast operation. It's a fire and forget kind of operation when client sends a request and then instantly forgets about it. Uh, the next operation is notification. Essentially, it's the same cast operation. Uh, it just serves a different pur purpose. And finally, there is a call operation when client sends a request and then receives a response from the server. And uh, messaging timeout is an error which can occur only during call operation. It happens when client successfully sends a request to the server but doesn't get a, re a reply in a predefined amount of time. Um, let's uh, view deeper uh, of which parts uh, call operation consists. So first, client sends a request, client puts a request into RabbitMQ. Then, RabbitMQ passes this request as a message to server. Then, server processes the request and produces a response. Uh, it puts it into RabbitMQ, and finally, client reads this uh, response from RabbitMQ. And the thing is uh, that messaging timeout error can occur if any of these stages, star starting from stage two to stage five, fails. How can you understand at which stage the failure occurred? Uh, the good thing is that in Mitaka we added a, a fine-grained logging where each request uh, is logged at each stage. So here on uh, on the screen you see an example when um, uh, Neutron, uh, I believe it's Neutron agent uh, sends a uh, L3 agent uh, sends a, a report to Neutron server. So here you see Neutron agent's log. Uh, it's uh, the first stage of the uh, request when it actually does the call, and the last stage when it receives a reply from the server. And here you can see an uh, example of Neutron server logs when uh, it receives a request and sends a reply back to the client. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is how actually you can get these debug logs. Most people think that it is enough to put uh, a client debug equals true and you got it. But uh, unfortunately, it's not like uh, it's not that easy for messaging. What you actually need to do instead is you need to find a line default log levels, uh, uncomment it, and find inside it uh, also messaging and set it to debug. Uh, so uh, sometimes it happens that you actually uh, you see the failure, but you didn't have uh, debug enabled in advance, and still you need to analyze the failure and produce like a report. Uh, what can you do in that case? Uh, first, uh, examine the stack trace. Uh, find in the stack trace which operation actually failed. Uh, guess the destination service and uh, try to find the correlating log entry in the destination service logs. Uh, for example, uh, here is a stack trace, and uh, a highlighted line, it shows that the request, it was a report state request of in JCP agent, and uh, such kind of requests go into the Neutron server. Uh, obviously, you need to understand uh, OpenStack uh, architecture in order to guess the destination service uh, which uh, should uh, process the request. Uh, and also, uh, another thing is that uh, you'll have, when looking into logs of the server, if you have several instances of the server, for instance, a uh, Neutron server, you need to, lo uh, to look into logs of each instance because you don't know the exact instance which processed the message. Uh, 
and uh, going back, if you have debug on enabled, then uh, debug shows the unique message ID, which is uh, essentially the same through all the stages of uh, request response. Uh, also, you can diagnose issues in messaging through RabbitMQ, actually. Uh, here is the first useful command. Uh, it uh, lists uh, the queue, all the queues in uh, RabbitMQ, uh, number of consumers queue has, and its name. Uh, also, it is very convenient that the output is uh, sorted by the first column, which is consumers in that case. And that way, you can spot uh, queues which, has zero, which have zero consumers. Uh, and that might indicate a problem, because if queue has zero consumers, nobody listens to it, nobody processes requests. Uh, it, uh, and one of the reasons why it might happen is because actually the corresponding service died. Um, another useful command is uh, actually essentially the same list queues command, uh, except it uh, uh, as you see, I've added a messages column in it. So it will uh, output number of messages uh, which are currently in that queue. Uh, why it is useful? Um, because you might spot, uh, spot that some queue has a lot of messages accumulated in it. And uh, it might indicate several different problems. Uh, first, it might be that the corresponding service just can't cope with the load. Uh, obviously, you might uh, if all worked well before, you need to investigate why it happens. Uh, another reason is that the processing service, it might get stuck. And finally, uh, more funny kind of error, it might happen that uh, you, if you are using RabbitMQ cluster, that your cluster is partitioned. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding the cluster partitioning, uh, you will save you a lot of time if you actually check that your cluster is whole by running this command. Uh, if, um, so what you need to do is you need to ensure that uh, running nodes list contains all RabbitMQ nodes in the cluster. Uh, because if it's not, uh, the failures, uh, they are very different, but in general, your OpenStack will be com completely inoperable. Uh, now, uh, a little more how you can actually fix such issues when you find them. Uh, first, uh, if you see a problem with RabbitMQ, then obviously you need to look into RabbitMQ docs and see what you can, or how you can fix it. Uh, in case the problem is not in the RabbitMQ, then um, in many cases, restart of the corresponding service, OpenStack service, might help. What you need to do is, using the debug, you, you need to find actually which service fails. Uh, oh. Uh, and the third way, uh, it's more mild way, instead of um, uh, restarting the services, you might uh, close the connections from services to RabbitMQ and hence force them to reconnect. Uh, so that's uh, all I have. Uh, like, that's, these are all my advice. Uh, this mm, about troubleshooting. Uh, now I want uh, like, uh, to make several suggestions how you how you can make your life easier. So the first suggestion is uh, oh, we have that parameter MQP auto delete uh, in Oslo messaging. The suggestion is never ever set it to true. Uh, so, uh, what it does, it uh, if you in a, uh, if you set it to true, uh, all your queues will be created with auto delete flag, and uh, that means when consuming service dies, the queue will be deleted as well. Uh, it's pretty convenient, works as garbage collection, but it has its downsides, which I describe later. If you really want this garbage collection, uh, you, it is much better. It would be much better if you instead use queue expiration policy, uh, with uh, some sane uh, time to leave for, for example, one minute. Uh, here is uh, the link to uh, the RabbitMQ documentation uh, saying how you can enable this policy. Uh, we'll share this presentation afterwards, so you can go to the link and see how it works. Uh, one of the advantages of the policies over auto delete flag is that policies can be changed at the runtime uh, without uh, 
And uh, as for auto delete plug, you need to actually destroy your queue and recreate it with a different setting if you want to change auto delete. Uh, also, uh, actually, uh, uh, irregardless of how you set this flag, Oslo Messaging uh, created some queues with this flag enabled. Uh, are reply queues and fanout queues. Uh, that worked before Mitaka, and starting from Mitaka, we changed uh, these queues to expiring ones. So uh, you're safe here. Uh, now, I think uh, I own your explanation why you shouldn't use uh, these auto delete flag. So uh, imagine you actually set it to true. Uh, what might happen in uh, interaction between OpenStack services. So here we see uh, a conductor, and for instance, it sends a request to Nova Compute to spawn a VM. But before it sends the request, the following happens. Uh, network hiccups, and Nova Compute loses connection to RabbitMQ. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Nova Conductor uh, actually sends the request to spawn a VM. OK, and uh, then RabbitMQ kicks in. It sees that uh, Q has no consumers, and it has auto delete flag enabled. And what it does, it deletes the queue completely. Next, what you see is Nova Computer reconnects back to RabbitMQ, recreates the queue. Uh, all goes fine, except the message which was there, it lost, com it was, it's lost, uh, it's just lost forever. So, and what you have, you have uh, your VM stuck in spawning state forever. Uh, the next advice I have is, uh, um, in case you use RabbitMQ cluster and maybe you are using queue mirroring, what I want to add is that queue mirroring is quite expensive. Uh, our test shows that on three node RabbitMQ cluster, uh, if you enable queue mirroring, then your throughput will actually drop twice. And actually, uh, when we're speaking about RPC, uh, queue mirroring uh, and HA actually is not essential for RPC. So uh, it might be just not worth the trouble and uh, throughput is uh, more important for you. Uh, but another point is that uh, it might be that notifications are important for you. Uh, that happens in case if you use them for billing, for instance. In that case, what you can do is you can disable RPC for, or sorry, disable HA for RPC queues, but you can enable it for notifications. Uh, if you want to do, if you want to know how to do that, uh, here is a, a link. Uh, by the link, you can find how we do that in Fuel. Um, and the final piece of advice I have, or better to say a uh, suggestion or maybe advertisement, uh, in Mitaka we developed uh, uh, a feature where you can actually uh, specify different backends for RPC and notifications. And uh, here you are free to use actually different drivers. Or you can use the same driver and uh, so that, for example, uh, RPC messages go through one RabbitMQ and notifications go through a different RabbitMQ and you can uh, set up them differently for whatever you need. Uh, here is the link to implementation. Uh, unfortunately, it's not well documented yet, so uh, you will have to look into the code to understand how you can configure it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's, uh, that's it for my part. And I pass the mic to Michael. Thank you, Dmitry. So we're going to talk a little bit about things that are not OpenStack specific, that are general problems that my team has to, you know, we, we answer those questions every single day. I'm not overstating it. Uh, so yeah, if I say something that doesn't exactly fit the context of OpenStack, that's probably why. So let's start. Um, with a picture of a rabbit that face palms. Uh, also, let's see if I can do something about this dog. Yep, that's better. Okay, so uh, first issue, it's not that 
common, but people completely panic when they see this. So RabbitMQ runs on the Erlang VM, and every once in a while, someone comes to the mailing list that says, hey, my Erlang VM just disappeared. My monitoring system says it used to be there, but it, no, it's no longer. Uh, so what happens? Now, for those who deploy your private clouds in the Caribbean, you could blame it on the Bermuda Triangle, but most of us aren't this lucky, right? So we need to investigate. Uh, about 95%, this is not very scientific, of issues that um, lead to this is A, Linux is out of memory killer. Uh, that's pretty easy to investigate. Just take a look at syslog and grab things. Uh, or B, you might have run into a number of, a small number of known runtime issues. This is one popular example. Uh, this particular guy means that either you run a 32-bit Erlang runtime on a 64-bit machine, which is a bad idea for fairly obvious reasons, don't do that. Uh, or you are hitting a known bug, which at least I personally don't recall seeing ever since maybe 17.5. Uh, yeah, so those are two common uh, scenarios. So let's move on. Uh, the next uh, question that we get answered a lot, so how do I know what exactly consumes RAM in my, on my node or in my cluster? Uh, again, there can be all kinds of reasons. Let's take a look at some of them. First of all, don't guess. Uh, use RabbitMQ control status, it contains uh, a rough, um, you know, a breakdown of what RabbitMQ thinks uses memory. It's not 100% precise because we're at the mercy of the runtime, uh, but it's good enough in most cases. Uh, so, just as Mintry has mentioned before, you can use, you can list queues and uh, see how much memory each individual queue uses that way. Right, so one specific case of this is RabbitMQ has uh, a management plugin which collects stats about things in your cluster and displays them and presents an HTTP API. So the thing that collects stats uh, historically has been a single Erlang process or a single thread, if you will, that does way too much. And so once uh, you have things in the cluster, connections, channels, queues, and nodes. They emit stats periodically. Once you have enough things, like enough connections, for example, you don't even have to have uh, a particularly high message rate. That thing can get uh, get, can start falling behind, which means it, it is getting me uh, messages or stats faster than it can process them. Um, so one way to see if that's the case is again run RabbitMQ control status and see and look for the uh, management DB key. And if you see that it is disproportionately larger to most other things that might mean, and, and more importantly if it's growing, then that might mean this is exactly what's going on. So you can reset the management DB using RabbitMQ control eval. Uh, this is a safe thing to do. You can run it against any cluster node. It doesn't have to be uh, the one that hosts the stats database. It's a fairly safe thing to do, so while there are tweaks that can reduce uh, how, how many stats are emitted per unit of time, uh, worst case scenario, you can just add a Chrome job that resets it every however many minutes you feel appropriate. Uh, the only caveat with that is once you reset uh, the sta stats database, it doesn't have any data in it, obviously, and before um, the next time that connections or queues uh, emit something, they, as far as this database is concerned, they do not exist. So this may wreak havoc to your monitoring system, and we have seen cases where monitoring goes completely crazy about this. Um, yeah, so be careful. But it takes, I don't know, two or three seconds for that database to restart, probably even less, so that is an option. But of course, this is not exactly what RabbitMQ should be doing, right? We should have a parallelized event collector. Uh, so that's this common in RabbitMQ 362, which is, uh, there is a release candidate of it. So feel free to give it a try. And it's like 20 processes instead of one. So you can expect th that things uh, have gotten a bit better. Uh, 
Uh, so moving on, uh, there is a plugin called RabbitMQTOP. Uh, all of you are probably familiar with the top tool, with the Unix command line thing. Uh, this is a similar tool for uh, RabbitMQ processes. Erlang has its own tools in that area. We are not going to get into that, but uh, you can, in modern RabbitMQ versions, you can enable and disable plugins on the fly. So you can temporarily enable it and take a look. So, but queues and messages and stats are not the only things that can consume uh, RAM. So connections actually do, and um, every connection consumes, let's say, a couple of hundred kilobytes. Now, why is that? Does RabbitMQ has a lot of connection state? Uh, do we, did we do something stupid so it allocates that much RAM? No, the answer is, uh, and by the, the same is true for, con for channels, even though it's way, way, way less. Uh, the answer is every connection has two TCP buffers, right? And those are auto-tunable on Linux and about 100K by default. It can range from 96 to 128, something like that. So you can reduce it in RabbitMQ and the OS alike. Uh, take a look at the docs about how to do that. And this is the primary uh, knob you can tweak if you want to support more connections uh, because RAM will be your uh, most likely bottleneck. Um, and also, a little known fact that if you can, you can limit the number of channels on a connection just as a safety measure, like uh, cap it at maybe 64 or 128 or something like that, uh, using this, uh, uh, this setting key. Uh, yeah, so imagine that the, ne the next uh, common scenario is you have a node that's not very responsive. There can be all kinds of reasons for it, but one... Uh, one little known tool, or at least underappreciated tool that can help you with that, is this guy. It will, if you're familiar with GVM thread dumps, or I think they are called the same way in .NET, uh, that is basically what it does. It just, it uses a pretty simplistic technique to detect processes that have their stack trace, uh, you know, not, not progressing in a certain period of time. And, it would simply output a bunch of information about those processes. And again, like I said, there can be all kinds of reasons for unresponsive nodes, but by looking at this information, you can usually narrow things down quite quickly. Um, so in, in the last couple of months, Erlang Solutions and Pivotal have identified a bunch of deadlocks in the data store that RabbitMQ uses internally for uh, metadata, like queues, channels, users, vhosts, and so on, but not messages. Uh, and yeah, there were cases where you could run into a distributed deadlock. Uh, as far as we know, they are all in Erlang OCP 18.3.1, and like four of them, if I remember correctly, are now a thing of the past, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, so let's move on. TCP connections are rejected, so your uh, OpenStack components try to connect to RabbitMQ and, and fail. Um, so this is really basic. I understand that most of the audience are highly competent engineers, but you have no idea how frequently we have to uh, tell people that, hey, you need to actually allow traffic on your firewall. Um, so this is one thing to check. Uh, ensure that if, if your machine has multiple uh, network interfaces, ensure that RabbitMQ listens on the correct one. By default, it's all, so, but just in case. Uh, check the open file handle limit in your operating system because defaults on Linux are great for running GNOME, but not modern servers. They are completely insane. It's, uh, I think, 1,024 1, connect connections. That's, by the way, for every single process, not just uh, RabbitMQ or something like that. Oh, no, it is per process, but in any case, it's inadequate for servers such as RabbitMQ, such as MySQL. So you have to bump it to bump it to half a million and forget about it. It's you would spend, uh, pay a, a very small penalty in terms of how much RAM the kernel uses, but that's nothing compared to the inconvenience that you would get when your clients cannot connect. Uh, so another thing that happens, so the open file handles limit limits how many uh, open file uh, handles, including sockets, a, a process can have at the same time. Uh, but that thing is not exactly what might, uh, uh, what might be the bottleneck in your case. Another thing, imagine that you had 
uh, uh, a network failure between your clients and RabbitMQ, and then it healed, and then clients uh, reconnect uh, en masse, right? So you have uh, hundreds or thousands of clients reconnecting. So the way inbound TCP connections are handled is that they are put in a queue. This has nothing to do with RabbitMQ queues, just the data structure. Um, or they form a backlog, if you will, and that backlog is of limited size. And soon as it reaches the limit, all new connections are rejected by the kernel. So you can tweak it per socket using RabbitMQ settings. There are also um, uh, uh, there are several kernel settings, Netcore, um, uh, SO, SO Max connections is probably the most important one that you have to tweak. Again, the defaults in Rabbit, it's 128, I think. Arguably, it's OK for most people. Uh, but in the kernel, I would say they are a bit inadequate. Uh, lastly, again, it's kind of obvious, but you have no idea how often we have to tell people that, hey, check out logs. There are probably something. Uh, so TLS connections fail, right? Uh, this deserves a talk on its own. I'm not going to explain how public key infrastructure works or any, any of that. Uh, again, see log files, all TLS uh, authentication or peer verification and other reasons uh, are logged. And error messages, they often come from libraries such as OpenSSL. They're not very sensible, but you can at least Google what's going on. That's much better than guessing. But what is even better than guessing is, or, or using logs, is using tools. So one of the uh, tools is OpenSSL as client. It lets you open a connection uh, with TLS, with your provided uh, certificate key pair uh, to any server that has TLS enabled, including RabbitMQ. This helps, and, and there is a server alternative. Uh, so those two will help you narrow down, is it a client issue? Or a, or a server issue. And almost always the issue ends up being that one of the peers doesn't trust the other, or if you use chain certificates, that verification depth is insufficient. Uh, so there is a guide on rabbitmq.com, has been around for quite a while, about troubleshooting TLS using OpenSSL as client and then server and so on, so check it out. Uh, lastly, we have seen known limitations in the TLS and crypto modules in our line prior to, say, 17.5. So this is what we highly recommend if you use TLS. Um, otherwise, you might run into fairly obscure issues, but which come down to the fact that certain, for example, elliptic curve algorithms are not supported. But the error message, of course, doesn't say that. It says something completely different because OpenSSL. Uh, right, so another thing that every once in a while I have to do is message payload inspection. You want to see what flows through RabbitMQ. Um, so RabbitMQ has a tracing feature, which means that every message that uh, is published to a vhost will be republished to, to the same q.rabbitmq.trace exchange. It's a topic exchange, so you can use any RabbitMQ client to consume messages that go there. And um, yeah, see them, see see what's there, including the payload. Uh, there is a plugin that basically has a web UI for it. Uh, but keep in mind that tracing puts a lot of pressure on the system. You basically replicate your entire traffic, at least for that we host. And yeah, that you use that carefully. Again, uh, it can be enabled and disabled on the fly. Uh, Lastly, uh, if, if that fails, just use TCP dump or Wireshark, which is a, a GUI tool uh, built on the same library. And it will display MQP 0.9.1 traffic as well as TCP fields and so on. It's extremely helpful when you have to debug something. And it also can work with TLS connections if you give it a certificate key pair. Uh, right, so another issue that's not obvious is higher than expected latency. There can be all kinds of reasons for it, but let's name some of you. Again, using Wireshark, you can narrow down which component in OpenStack or maybe RabbitMQ itself introduces it. Just see uh, TCP segment timestamps that can be you know, precise enough to narrow things down. Uh, then use something like S-Trace, D-Trace. There are all kinds of tools. So we'll get to that. 
to narrow the problem down further. And also be aware of the fact that Erlang VM has something called schedulers. Those are things that run your code. Uh, and they can be pinned or bound in the Erlang parlance to CPU cores. So if you have a multi-core system, especially a new, uh, a, NUMA, a NUMA one, you really would, would like to avoid scheduler to core migration because that ruins effectiveness of CPU caches and so on and can introduce latency spike for no obvious reasons. So just by switching uh, ske scheduler to core binding strategy with a virtual machine configuration flag can sometimes help a lot. But this is workload and system dependent. Just, just be aware of it. Right, so you, you might have noticed a general theme here. Again, I understand that folks in this room are hi highly competent engineers, but I do RabbitMQ support uh, seven days a week effectively, and I answer the same questions over and over. I have to recommend the same thing over and over. So one of them, guessing is not an effective or efficient debugging strategy. Don't do that. So what do you do instead of guessing? Uh, use tools to gather some data that would help you to form a hypothesis. Like uh, always consult log files for both Oslo messaging and RabbitMQ, and if you run, if you use HEProxy or a different intermediary for connections that also logs things and has a management UI and can affect, um, can affect your system's operations. Uh, lastly, ask on RabbitMQ users. We see a very small number of folks who come to us and ask questions in the context of OpenStack. We're not entirely sure why. Maybe we just don't know that their questions uh, are related to OpenStack, but yeah. Um, that mailing list the entire RabbitMQ team is on, and we are happy to answer your questions. But if you never come to ask them, there is not much we can do. Lastly, here are the tools uh, that can help you collect some data about how your TCP stack works, how your IP stack works, what happens with drivers, applications, system calls. Uh, uh, scheduler stats, virtual memory stats, I.O. stats, all kinds of things. Uh, now, no need to, to become an expert in all of them, but you can probably pick like five that would already give you a lot of, uh, that already would make you a couple of orders of magnitude more efficient than if you apply the typical guess and ask on Stack Overflow kind of debugging uh, approach. Right, thank you, and let's uh, open up for questions if we have time. Specifically about uh, reconnection in Kilo. Uh, so we have had issues where uh, the comp when one of the controllers goes down, the compute node goes into this loop of timed out waiting for a response, and the only solution seems to be re uh, restarting the compute node. Do you have any better strategy than that? This is specifically targeted at Kilo. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have multiple controllers? Uh, yes, I do, and one of them goes down. Uh, the mm -hmm. trigger is one of the controllers going down. Uh -huh. And uh, after that, you see uh, constant messaging timeouts on compute side. Correct, and this is with heartbeat turned on. Uh, I can't tell right now what happens because, uh, as I told earlier in my slides, uh, that can be due to various reasons. Uh, you really need to enable debug and see where your messages get stuck because actually, if you use multiple controllers, then uh, while one controller is down, other controllers should be able to process your messages. And uh, I believe them, I've seen them doing so. So this is not in the context of OpenStack, but j as a general remark, automatic reconnection to RabbitMQ and RabbitMQ clients is mostly a solved problem. I say mostly because you know people want some kind of improvement. Uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of features you have; they always want more. But in a bunch of languages, sadly, in a bunch of clients, sadly, maybe Pika is one of them, but certainly Combo isn't. O automatic reconnection has been around for years, so. This can be improved greatly at the library level. Just, just saying. I just want to add: if you see actually messaging timeouts, then you don't really have problem with connections because that means that a uh, uh, compute was able to send requests to uh, RabbitMQ. So it's not a connection problem. Problem is somewhere else. 
Yeah, I agree. Actually, I said the same problem, and that was conductor. <laughs> I restarted conductor, and everything started working again. Yeah, I was just looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a solution, but I see the same problem. During the HA failover, that's happened here, yeah, I know. So my question, uh, you said something that uh, the HA for the queues is, the replication is not really essential. Can you elaborate on that one? Uh, uh, sorry, come again? What? So you said something that HA for the queues on RabbitMQ, just replication of the queue is not really essential, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that is related to the MQP, MQP uh, protocol, which basically handles like a... a uh, no, no, no. Uh, what I meant, um, so uh, if you enable HA, uh, you uh, uh, you became more resilient. Messages never get lost, right? Uh, if you dis if you don't enable HA, then messages might get lost. For instance, uh, uh, if message was in a node which which went down, then essentially you've lost a message. Uh, what I meant is that it is not essential because failures occur very rarely in production environments. I mean, server failures, and what you get as a result, okay, several VMs stuck in spawning state or something else. Uh, you can manually clean it up. But on the other side, if you don't enable Che, then you get twice as much throughput on normal operations, which, uh, to my mind, may be, mm -hmm. may be uh, important. Okay, thanks. So I would like to add that there is a trade-off between throughput and safety in every data service. RabbitMQ is one example, but you see the same in data stores and many other systems. Uh, I think the point is that you don't have to mirror everything. Some data is more important than other. Uh, some data is transient. In other words, you don't want to have it after a certain period of time. So for those cases, just don't mirror. Or it, at least not mirroring could be a reasonable trade-off. Uh, a bit more about uh, RabbitMQ reconnection. It's well known between all ops. It's called rabbit crocs. Rabbit have nothing to do with this. But basically, if so something happens around RabbitMQ, you have half open stacks just doing something, stra something strange or do nothing. And the question is, how we can quickly diagnose this situation? Is any specific signs for Nova Conductor stuck in this uh, state? Uh, Let's start with that. Uh, about which re about which release are you speaking? Of? Uh, well, we are actually running pretty old release, planning to upgrade. It's more theoretical question. Uh, how we can know that Nova Conductor no longer operates on Rabbit? Uh, did, hmm? uh, did you try to check uh, uh, actually if? Uh, the conductor queue somebody consumes from conductor queue. I've listed a command with RabbitMQTL uh, list queues uh, consumers name. Uh, if you see zero consumers, that means nobody consumes. Uh, I, I believe I've seen such situations uh, when during failover, uh, consumers just broke off and never connected. Uh, I think I've seen uh, on the later releases, I've seen such cases rarer. Uh, can we have more pro proactive way to know this, some kind of ping message to conductor to send and receive answer? Uh, how about uh, actually monitoring number of consumers? If you see uh, that it drops, then if number of consumers doesn't equal to number of uh, conductors you have, then it's a problem. Mm. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, can we have some active check for Nova Conductor? Something like sending by message queue message, are you here, and to receive answer for monitoring? Because checking Rabbit is kind of, we need to, dip, to take, take in account TCP timeouts, all those things. And it's really useful to have tool to just to see it's operational. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, okay, uh, I got it. Is question. that time of uh, is that type of message in Oslo protocol? Uh, no, there is no su such type. Uh, just to check if consumer alive, but maybe it's worth the effort. Uh, what I worked mostly is uh, trying to ensure that conductor or Oslo messaging server just doesn't die. Uh, I, I never thought in that direction, which you suggested. Okay, thank you. So, my take on this is that multiple probably most sane messaging protocols, including like three or four, uh, out of four that RabbitMQ supports. Actually, no, it's four out of four. Uh, 
they support something called heartbeats or however else or keep alive things. What they do is actually they let you detect TCP connection and availability earlier. So they undo some of the things in TCP, in fact, effectively. So you, that is a feature that exists at the protocol level. I understand that checking if something is alive is, involves more than that. I'm not entirely sure what exists in OpenStack. But what I see around RabbitMQ is not, not everybody agrees uh, how exactly monitoring should be done. So there is no consensus yet. Gentlemen, we are five minutes over the time, so any Q&A can be done in the hallway. Thank you. Uh, but uh, can we ask more questions? You, you. Uh, in the hall, please. Just come to us. <laughs>